It's a guy named Mickey Mantle, who was the uh, star center fielder for the New York Yankees in the 50s and 60s. And uh, he once told an interesting story early in his career. He was in a horrible slump. And he had another game in which he uh, struck out three times in a row. Goes back into the clubhouse, just said he sat on the, sat on the stool, put his head in his hands, said he felt like crying, sat there for a long time, and then he said he heard somebody come up next to him and uh, just kind of looked out of his corner of his eyes, and it was little Timmy Barra, uh, Yogi Barra's little son at the time, and Timmy is kind of taps him on the knees, and uh, Mickey Mantle said, I just figured he's going to say something nice like, hang in there, I love you, Mickey. And he taps him, looks him in the eye and says, you stink. <laughs> and Mantle said, it did not do much for me. <laughs> in our lesson today, the disciples of Jesus really are demoralized. They're really ready to quit, and that might surprise you, because this is not long after Christ's resurrection, and you would think they would be utterly exhilarated. But remember that they had just been on an absolute roller coaster of emotions the last couple weeks. They had uh, seen the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. They saw him teaching in the temple, and sort of really uh, the crowds being so excited by this. Then they had seen the betrayal by Judas, one of their friends. They had seen how they had abandoned Jesus. They had seen how Peter denied knowing Jesus, denied being a follower of Jesus, denied that he ever trusted in Jesus. And then perhaps off in the distance they saw Jesus being crucified, but even if they hadn't seen it, they had known what happened. And then just when their morale was at the lowest, they have these events of the first Easter Sunday, the resurrection, and the subsequent appearances of the risen Lord, including Easter Sunday night when he appeared to them behind locked doors. I imagine their heads were just spinning. After all, resurrection is not something people experience. Even worse, these events exposed in them their own incredible weaknesses for Peter, It was his denial. Thomas proved to be a doubter. And the others were fearful, and they abandoned Jesus. And if Christ is alive, they had to have been asking, how can he really count on us? We failed him when he needed us the most. And I imagine that's why their heads were hanging. And as we get to the beginning of the story today, it's not that they uh, doubted Jesus. It's that I imagine they had a lot of self-doubt. I imagine all of us have let someone down in a big way in this life. And if we've done that, have you ever dreaded seeing that person afterward, not because they have wronged you, but because you have failed them in such a big way? At times it might be easier just to let go of the relationship than bear the shame of seeing them face to face. And so in the story today, 70 of these disciples, they head all the way away from Jerusalem up to Galilee, and you could say it's sort of like a time out or a retreat, but they head to the Sea of Galilee. And Galilee was their home. And home is often where we retreat when things are uncertain. And they were back where it all began, back where they met Jesus by the sea. And it's a great story, wonderful story. Where, where Peter says to uh, the other six who were there, I'm going to go fishing. And uh, they say, we'll go, we'll go with you, we'll go with you. And Peter seemingly had failed in the work that Jesus had called him to do, to be a fisher of humanity. And now, what, in, in a sense, what he goes back to doing is what he knew best, fishing for fish on the Sea of Galilee. Perhaps it is this being a fisher of humanity was just too difficult for him. And he really, I, I, I think there's some sense he didn't know if he was really worthy to do anything other than fish in a boat. So he has this retreat. Peter, having denied Jesus, thought ultimately, I think he thought he had forfeited the privilege 
of being a witness for Jesus in the world. So he says, I'm going back to what is safe. And uh, I don't know about you, but I understand that. I understand that sometimes in life when you're unsure, the default reaction is to always go back to what you know rather than taking a big leap of faith and trusting in God. And apparently these others were thinking pretty much the same thing because they all agreed, well, let's just go fishing. Let's go fishing. And they went fishing. They fished at night. They caught nothing. It was an exercise in futility. And then the morning light comes and Jesus shows up, just like he had behind the locked doors on Easter Sunday evening. But it says they did not recognize him. Perhaps it was they were too far from shore, or perhaps there was not enough light. But I think what you and I need to pay attention to is that sometimes we too fail to see Jesus in our midst when things aren't going the way we hope. He is right there when all our efforts are not bearing fruit. And it might be that he, we are so caught up in failure that it keeps us from seeing him in the midst of frustration. It might be that we're too distracted by what's going in our, on in our lives that we simply don't see the risen Lord in front of us. But what I need you to think about, and I, I was thinking about this this week, could it be that frustration and failure is sometimes a necessary part in us growing spiritually as Jesus' followers? I think there's a great myth in the world, one of the great myths nurtured by many immature Christians and many of these televangelist preachers that you see on TV, they proclaim that following Christ should move us from blessing to blessing to blessing, from success to success to success, to victory to victory to victory. And they sort of proclaim that when we have difficult times, it means God's not blessing our lives. And that is a bunch of baloney. Ask anybody in your life, ask anybody who has ever accomplished anything significant in this life where they learned their greatest lessons, and almost always they will say they learned a boatload from when things did not go their way. They learned a boatload when they felt defeated. They learned a boatload when they dealt with frustrations and obstacles. Life is about learning and growing at all stages, but life is about learning that God works in our life, and sometimes frustration is part of the process. I know failure hurts. Of course it hurts when uh, things don't go our way. The more passionate we are about something, the more we care about something, and it doesn't seem to go our way, it really, really stings. And so think about Peter's story. Think about what happened to him. We read that we remember how Peter wept bitterly three days, or that the, sort of the night of the Last Supper. He wept so bitterly because when the rooster crowed, he remembered that Jesus had told him at the Last Supper that he would deny him three times. He was hurting, hurting that night. But let me ask you this. Do you think Peter would ultimately have been as effective as he was in the long run if he had not had that experience and had not had the experience of the grace of Jesus after he had said flat out, I am not a follower of Jesus. Do you think he ever could have been the witness he was and that we remember to this day? I don't think there's any chance. But the good thing is he wept, he got it out, and remember he did not allow that, he did not allow himself to be frozen in shame, and neither should we when we're frustrated. There is always movement possible. I don't know what kind of failures or frustrations you've experienced in your life in the past or are currently experienced. Perhaps you've had a frustration in business or in a relationship or just any other sort of thing you're dealing with. Use it. Use it to grow. The question ultimately is how do we handle things when it doesn't go our way? Do we give in with a sense of fatality or do we say this is an opportunity to live by faith. Frustration is ultimately, and, and when, we feel def when we go through defeats, that's where we learn that God is always there with us. If you, ever, if you never try anything important in this world, you'll never learn that there is somebody there to catch you, always willing to catch you when you fall. Uh, there was a pastor once who had a friend, a uh, childhood friend, who uh, became a circus performer. 
And that friend described to him the experience of learning to work as a high trapeze artist, something I would be really scared to do. But uh, he claimed that once you know that the, the net below will catch you, you stop worrying about falling so much. You actually learn to fall successfully. And what that means is you can start concentrating far more on catching that trapeze that's swinging toward you and not concentrate on falling because the repeated falls in the past convince you, convince you that that net down below is strong, it's incredibly reliable, and that when you do fall, it will catch you. What he said is that gives you the confidence to be far more daring on the trapeze and that when you do fall, you can get up and you have the confidence to risk even more. I think that's one of the crucial benefits of living by faith. The more faith you have, the less you worry about failing. And how do you get that kind of faith? I think it means you, it, it means you're, you, you say, I trust that it's okay to fail because God will catch me and I'm surrounded by a community of faith who will still encourage me and still love me. People like you, people like me. Simon Peter discovered that. I think he discovered that in that story today in his time in Galilee on the sea and on that shore. I love how the story ends. It's, it's one of the most important, and it's, it's a great ending. Risen Jesus and his disciples are seated around a fire, and I imagine when Peter saw this charcoal fire, he had a flashback to that fire that was right outside the high priest's house where Jesus is inside, imprisoned, and a woman asks him, or he's asked three times, Do you, uh, are you a follower of Jesus? And he says, no way, I don't know him at all. I do not know him. And so uh, Jesus turns to Peter on the shore in front of this charcoal fire and says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he says, feed my lambs. Comes back at him. Second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time, one for each denial, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter's hurt. Peter's hurt, and he says, uh, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. And then I think almost get the sense that a light bulb went off when uh, light bulb went off sort of in his head. And Peter sa- kind of says, uh, I have not felt qualified. I have not felt like I'm worthy. And what Jesus is saying to him is, uh, you still have a place, you still have a purpose, and I desperately need you to go out and tell others about the saving love and the saving grace that I offer. Ultimately, that story is about you and I. We may not always feel like we're qualified to reach out in Gaithersburg, in Montgomery County, and in the course of our daily lives. But ultimately, what Jesus is saying to us, like he said to Peter, is be willing to risk. Be willing to invite another. Be willing to tell others why your faith matters. And trust, trust that God will be with you. You may not be perfect but trust that it will have a huge impact in the days to come. Amen.